We're Antarians. We come from a planet called Antaria. Yeah, that's what I pretty much figured. About a hundred centuries ago, we had an outpost here on Earth before the first upheaval. Well, I think I'm better off not knowing. Shh. Now, we were able to evacuate everyone except for my ground crew. Ground crew? And now we've come back for them. Cocoon was released by 20th Century Fox in the United States on the 19th of July 1985, arriving in the UK in September, receiving its international release later that year. Although early reports estimated Cocoon's budget at $13 million, its final cost was $17.5 million. Fox had put pressure on production when he decided to move up the scheduled Christmas 1985 release date to the 19th of July, believing that Cocoon would perform better without any competition from other holiday films which included the studio's own Enemy Mine and The Jewel of the Nile. The movie was a hit, with its opening weekend earning over $7.9 million, where it became the sixth highest grossing film of 1985, making a reported box office of $76 million in North America, with a total box office of $85 million, also receiving Oscar attention. From the farthest corner of a distant galaxy comes a fantasy to fill your heart. I'm ready to take all the world! It is everything you've dreamed of. It is nothing you expect. Well, I keep a secret. I wouldn't tell anybody. It is the mystery of an awesome secret. It is the miracle of everlasting life. We won't get any older and we won't ever die. Cocoon. Rated PG-13. The screenplay was written by Tom Benedict. Producer Lily Finizanek came across the idea for Cocoon in 1980 when she was given David Staplestein's manuscript. Lily's husband and partner Richard D. Zanuck and producer partner David Brown, who had worked on what is considered the first blockbuster, Jaws, agreed to purchase a 12-month option of David's treatment for roughly $7,500. When the first draft of Cocoon was completed in 1980, Fox's president, Cheryl Lanzin, was reluctant to proceed. Lily Zanuck then ordered a rewrite of the screenplay. At the end of 1982, however, Zanuck and Brown terminated their nearly four-year partnership with Fox, Shortly after they relocated to Warner Brothers, Fox had hoped to approve Benedict's new draft. Despite their enthusiasm, the studio could not proceed with Cocoon without Brown and Zanuck, who co-owned the rights to their property. As a result, the duo postponed the deal with Warner Brothers and returned to Fox to develop the picture. Robert Zemeckis was originally hired as director and spent a year working on Cocoon in development. He was directing another film for Fox, Romance in the Stone. However, when Top Brass from Fox previewed the movie, they hated it. Also in addition, his previous efforts, I Wanna Hold Your Hand and Use Cars, though critically acclaimed, were both commercial failures. Zank was forced to fire Zemeckis if he wanted Cocoon to be made. However, Romance in the Stone turned down to be a huge commercial success and gave Zemeckis the clout to do Back to the Future, which had previously been turned down by every major studio. Ron Howard, fresh off the critical and commercial success of Splash in 1984, had been hired as his replacement, allowing production to finally move ahead. Ron, of course, a famous child star, having appeared for George Lucas in American Graffiti, and of course he's best known for playing Richie Cunningham in the hit comedy Happy Days. Howard made revisions to the script to emphasise the relationships between the aliens and the human characters, however he received no on-screen credit for this. The plot follows peaceful aliens from the planet Antaria, who about 10,000 years ago set up an outpost on Earth, on Atlantis. When Atlantis sank, 20 aliens were left behind kept alive in large rock-like cocoons at the bottom of the ocean. Now a group of Antarians have returned to collect them. Disguising themselves as humans, they rent a house with a swimming pool and charge the water with life force to give the cocoons energy to survive the trip home. They charter a boat from a local captain named Jack, who helps them retrieve the cocoons. Next door to the house the visitors are renting is a retirement home. Three of us residents, Ben, Arthur and Joe, often trespass to swim in the pool next door. They absorb some of the life force, making them feel younger and stronger. I feel great. Me too. You wouldn't bullshit me. My God, I'm telling the truth. Huh? Why should he feel good? I feel tremendous. I'm ready to take all the world. Oh, oh. Jack spies on Kitty while she undresses in her cabin. He then discovers that she is an alien. After the aliens reveal themselves to him and explain what is going on, he decides to help them. Eventually Ben, Arthur and Joe are caught in the act, and they are given permission to use the pool by the Antarian leader, Walter, on the condition that they do not touch the cocoons or tell anybody else about it. Rejuvenated with the youthful energy, the three men begin to feel the benefits of the pool. 
The film stars a host of veteran actors. Don Amici stars as Arthur, a popular actor in the 30s and the 40s, starring in movies like Heaven Can Wait, seeing his film career a surge in a comeback in the 1980s, in movies like Trading Places in 1983. Wilford Brimley stars as Ben, and he turned 50 during filming. Brimley bleached his hair and moustache to turn them grey, and had wrinkles and liver spots drawn on his face. He's probably best known for his role in John Carpenter's The Thing, and has also appeared in the Star Wars spin-off TV movie Ewoks Battle of Endor. Jim Cronin stars as Joe, a veteran star of TV and movies, such as Crowded Paradise in 1956. Jessica Tandy stars as Alma. Tandy and Cronin were married in real life, and would appear together later in Batches Not Included. Tandy would go on to win an Oscar for a role in Driving Miss Daisy. Brian Dennehy plays the leader of the Antarians, Walter, an unusual role for the actor known for playing tough characters, like the Sheriff in First Blood, and also starred in FX and its sequel. Steve Gunberg stars as Jack Bonner. Nicolas Cage was considered for this role. Steve was known for his work on the Police Academy series, as well as later starring Leonard Nimoy's Three Men and a Baby. Tanny Welsh, daughter of screen icon Raquel Welsh, stars as Kitty in her first movie role. Tanny returned in the 1988 sequel, but was more successful in her modelling career. Barrett Oliver stars as David. Barrett, of course, is best remembered for his role as Bastion in The Neverending Story, as well as Daryl, also released in 1985. The movie also stars Tyrone Power Jr. This was Tyrone's first role. He was the son of Hollywood legend Tyrone Power and the half-brother to Tyrone Power, the star of Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. Other cast members include Jeff Guilford as Bernie, Warren Stapleton as Mary, Gwen Verdon as Bess and her to wear as Rose. Location filming took place in St. Petersburg, Florida between August 20th and November 1st, 1984. Locations included a 40-acre bay estate, the Suncoast Retirement Community, Coliseum Ballroom and Cafetti's Nightclub, as well as the Shuffleboard Club and Snell Arcade Buildings. In addition, the Bayside House was rented by the production team and renovated for the filming of the pool scenes, with a makeshift temporary structure built over the outdoor pool. The crew relocated to the Bahamas for the remainder of the production, where most of the underwater footage was shot. Actor Mike Nomad, who appears as one of the Antarians, was hired as a scuba diver instructor. He taught the cast, after he previously worked with Ron Howard coaching him on Splash. The movie's fantastic score was written and composed by the late, great James Horner. The film marked the first collaboration between Howard and Horner. He composed the music for many films directed by Ron Howard including Willow in 1988, Apollo 13 in 1985, and A Beautiful Mind in 2001, before the director turned to Hans Zimmer as his regular partner. In the mid-1980s, Horner composed scores for many fantasy and science fiction films, ranging from his two Star Trek scores to Krull and Aliens. Although Horner was guilty many times for reusing music cues, he does here. The music used for the part of the sequence, when the Coast Guard and the police are chasing the boat is nearly the same music that is used in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan in 1982, when Spock is in the engine room trying to fix the warp drive. However, Horner's set of themes for Cocoon established a style that has led to countless successes in following years. Cocoon was an opportunity for Horner to write what is commonly considered his first great dramatic score. This is a beautiful score that is sadly forgotten. Many viewers from the UK may remember that a sample from Cocoon's soundtrack was the basis for the dance hit by Time Rider, also named Cocoon. This was used for the theme tune for The Hitman and Her, a late night club show that was shown in the late 80s and early 90s on ITV that toured the nightclubs, mainly of the northwest of England, with pop Sven Garley, Pete Waterman, and kids TV presenter Michaela Strachan. Of course, this being the 80s, where would it be without a soft rock ballad track? Gravity was performed by Michael Cimbalo, and its music video was directed by Ron Howard. This was Howard's first and to date only music video. Cinematography by Tom Peterman, known for his work on Flashdance 1983, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home in 1986, and Men in Black in 1997, is gorgeous throughout, particularly the Coliseum Ballroom. Also, the underwater scenes shot in the Bahamas, where there's some also great footage of some real and not so real dolphins. ILM provided the special and visual effects, with Ken Ralston as VFX supervisor. Three decades on, some still work well, while others look dated, with the Ontarians having similar latex skin suit disguises to the visitors in 1983's miniseries V. 
I always found this a strange design and not really original, while the Ontarians who resemble space mummies were of course played by other actors, which included Wendy J. Cook, who also reprised the role in the sequel. I must admit, the scene where Jack witnesses Kitty removing a false skin disguise and looking back at Jack through his people totally freaked me out as a kid for many years. One practical effect I particularly like is the reveal of the dying Ontarian, which is still very effective, showing great emotion in an animatronic puppet. I guess in the post CGI age it is less likely to strike audiences, but was impressive back in 1985. It has similarities to Spielberg's tragic scene in ET, and of course the cult classic Life Force with its space vampire zombies, which was released at the same time as Cocoon. Nonetheless, they fully deserve the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects in 1985, especially Ralph McQuarrie for great concept design. You'd be forgiven for not thinking Steven Spielberg had an exec producer credit on this movie, given the similarities to Cocoon's movie poster to his movie E.T. the Extraterrestrial, as the artist John Alvin created both. Cocoon is one of those movies that I enjoyed a few times on his cinematic run in 1985, and one I watched a handful of times on home video, but kind of ignored it for a long time. Indeed, you don't really hear anybody talking about Cocoon these days, probably because it's one of those sci-fi movies that fell between the two stools, not cool enough for 80s kids weaned on the thrills of Star Wars, or smart enough for middle-aged people. It's probably played best with the older generation at the time, when Spielberg films were at their peak, and scripts like Batches Not Included were me made. Initially, I was drawn to it as a kid for the sci-fi elements in the trailer, which actually give a good amount of the story away, especially when Walter peels back his eye. Looking back, it's certainly a curious movie, produced at a time when sci-fi was mainly created for younger audiences, a fairly progressive movie, given its aging cast and themes of mortality. Upon re-watching Cocoon today, I certainly view it very differently as a kid. Back then, I was entertained by the fun exploits of the older cast running around and having fun. Watching Don Amici break dancing, of course this was achieved with a dancer wearing a mask that looked like Amici, plus use of clever lighting. There was enough of visual effects to keep me entertained and it's very generous to our running time. As mentioned earlier, most of these have held up well, apart from obvious matte lines here and there. The movie isn't without its faults. After immensely promising opening, and not unlike its aging cast, it has a sagging middle. It heads into the predictable territory of Spielberg-inspired science fiction. Comparisons to 1977's Close Encounters of the Third Kind are obvious. The tropes of the aliens from Atlantis has been done many times before, such in 1978's Warlords of Atlantis. There was also a saturation of youth-oriented films targeted at those under 18. Executives were not fond of these films, but the financial rewards were too significant to ignore. The few films aimed at older audiences like Coon were surprise successes. Only Back to the Future and Rambo First Blood Part 2 were successful blockbusters, earning more than double the box office of Cocoon. The glut of youth-targeted films like Return to Oz and The Black Cauldron and science fiction comedies like Weird Science had it resulted in a string of failures, Films about fantasy and magic failed as audiences leaned towards science fiction. Where Cocoon's strength lies as an older adult viewer comes from Howard's ability in working and developing great character performances. Even Gutenberg is less annoying here, his and Welsh's character's love story plays out well enough. However, Cocoon is definitely worth seeking out, especially for the excellent performances from the older cast members. Don Amici won a gong at the Oscars for Best Supporting Actor. I also enjoyed Jessica Tandy's performance and Wilford Brimley is also in outstanding form here. There are some religious themes and allegory at play. The Antarians are angelic creatures, even when the Antarians' plans are derailed by the residents, draining the life force giving their effects to their lost crew. There's no price to be paid, they simply offer them an alternative life, after helping return the cocoons to the ocean. The ending especially mirrors our understanding of the afterlife, in fact the old folk are even in a boat when they leave the earth. A bit of symbolism that evokes how dead souls are taken in Greek mythology, highlighting the realisation of the passing of time and its potentials and the pitfalls of ageing for us all, something you don't consider as a kid. Gone to Ron Howard, several members of the cast like to get into hypothetical discussions about the chances their characters were offered in the film. Maureen Stapleton was dead against it, while Don Amici said he'd be the first in line. I feel Cocoon is one of those overlooked mid-80s movies, 
I'm guilty of it myself, but I'm so happy now to have rediscovered it. It's a movie I have fond memories as a kid, and James Horner's score brought on a huge sense of nostalgia. The film holds a 79% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes from 28 critics. The critical consensus reads, though it may be too sentimental for some, Ron Howard's supernatural tale of eternal youth is gentle and heartwarming, touching on poignant issues of the ageing process. Because of the film's success, a sequel, Cocoon the Return, was released in 1988, directed by Daniel Petrie and written by Stephen McPherson. All the actors from the first film reprise their roles in the film, although Brian Dennehy only appears in one scene at the end. Unlike its predecessor, the film was neither a commercial nor critical success, almost undermining the first film's finality of death and heaven metaphors. Dable Staplestein has gone on to publish a trilogy of successful novels and wrote the story for Beyond the Stars in 1986. Cocoon is available on Blu-ray from Eureka, who produced a 30th anniversary edition in 2016, with a beautiful transfer that is worth seeking out. I highly recommend Cocoon. It's a movie like The Floridian Residence that has matured well. Morning, morning. Hi. Excuse me. You think there's cocaine in that pool? Might be. What if we OD? Well, we'll keep an eye on each other. I'll watch him, you watch him, you watch me. Perfect! If you enjoy my content, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the bell notification to keep up to date with my latest content. Please like, share and leave me a comment on your thoughts on Cocoon. Take care and thanks for watching.